Hi there, and welcome to this video on A-Level Biology for the AQA specification, focusing on the topic of cells, and in particular, on cell division, cell cycle, and mitosis. I'm Manisha from StudyMind, where we help you to revise A-Level Biology with our helpful video tutorials tailored to your subject your specification, and to you. If you're new here, please make sure to click that subscribe button. And whilst you're watching, feel free to leave any comments down below of anything you're unsure about, and let us know if it's your first time watching so we can send you our free revision resources. We also have helpful timestamps to guide you through the specification. Welcome to lesson five of nine in this tutorial covering the cell cycle and mitosis. This is the fifth video in our series of nine lessons on the topic of cell structure. In the last lesson, we looked at microscopes and the processes involved in cell fractionation. Here are the key learning objectives for today's lesson. First, we'll look at the cell division and the cell cycle, then at the stages of mitosis, and finally, at cancer. Here are the AQA learning objectives for this tutorial. Feel free to pause the video now and have a quick read through them before we begin. We'll start by looking at the ability of cells to divide. Cell division has multiple functions. In eukaryotes, cells need to divide and replace old dying and dead cells for the survival and growth of the organism. In most eukaryotic organisms, we've got two types of cells, some cells that can divide and some cells that cannot divide. Now let's look at eukaryotic cells. The cell cycle refers to the sequence of events occurring during cell division, while one parent cell divides to form two genetically identical daughter cells. We can break this process down into three phases. The first is interphase. In interphase, we have the S phase, in which DNA replication occurs, and G1 and G2, where new proteins and organelles are made. We then get the division of the nucleus and the separation of chromatids in mitosis. Finally, we have cytokinesis as the cytoplasm divides. Next, we'll move on to look at when DNA replication occurs. These are the three stages of cell cycle again, interphase, mitosis, and cytokinesis. There are three phases of interphase. These are G1, S and G2. Each phase has unique events that occur. G1 stands for gap 1 phase. In this phase, the cell will grow and make a new set of organelles and proteins for the daughter cells. S stands for synthesis phase. Here, the cellular DNA is replicated and the two daughter cells each get one set of DNA. In this phase, we also get the checking of genetic material. G2 stands for gap 2 phase. Here, cell growth continues and there is synthesis of special proteins in preparation for mitosis to occur. During interphase, the cell function will continue normally. In addition to preparing itself for cell division, the cell continues to carry out the normal functions that it is responsible for. Hepatocytes in the liver, for example, continue to carry out their normal responsibilities of detoxification. Epithelial cells that make up the villi in the small intestine continue to absorb nutrients from digested food and transport them into the blood. The cell cycle ends with mitosis. During this phase, the cell splits its DNA and organelles into two identical daughter cells. Now, 
we'll move on to look at mitosis in more detail. After interphase, the cell divides in mitosis. The eukaryotic cell divides to produce two daughter cells, each with the identical copies of DNA produced by the parent cell during DNA replication. Mitosis is the mechanism of cell division that occurs in cells known as somatic cells. These are the majority of dividing cells in an organism. Meiosis is a cell division process that occurs in cells known as gametes. Gametes are the sperm and the egg, which play a role in sexual reproduction. In this section, we'll only be focusing our attention on mitosis. But do pay close attention, as much of the processes of mitosis show up in meiosis as well. Our next learning objective is to look at chromosomal behaviour. In order to fully understand mitosis, we first need to spend some time learning the structure of chromosomes. Chromosomes are large structures of DNA and proteins. DNA in cells is wrapped around proteins called histones, which results in a structure called chromatin. Chromatin is coiled into chromosomes. This summarises what we just spoke about. Here are some chromosomes. On the left, we can see haploid chromosomes, while on the right, we can see diploid chromosomes. Humans have 23 different chromosomes which exist in pairs. This makes us diploid organisms. We mean two sets of each chromosome. Hence, this means we have 46 chromosomes in a single cell nucleus. Organisms with only one chromosome of each type are called haploid organisms. Organisms with three copies of each chromosome are called triploid, whilst four chromosomes would be called tetraploid. Each copy of a particular chromosome is called a chromatid. Each chromosome is made up of two copies. A chromatid has two arms which are held together by a centromere. In most eukaryotic cells, two sister chromatids, which are both nearly identical copies of the same type of chromosome, are joined together at the centromere. Now, we will cover the stages of the cell cycle. Let's look at the stages of mitosis in some more detail. After interphase, the cell divides in mitosis. Eukaryotic cells divide to produce two daughter cells. Each of these daughter cells has identical copies of DNA produced by the parent cell during DNA replication. During S phase, the cell replicates the DNA. DNA replication results in two copies of each chromosome. After S phase, the cell will have 92 chromosomes, making it tetraploid. The new copies are called homologous chromosomes. The chromosomes then split in mitosis, meaning that each daughter cell gets 46 chromosomes. During prophase, centrioles, which are tiny organelles, will split and move to opposite ends of the cell. The centrioles will produce special protein fibres, which are mitotic spindles, which extend across the cell. At the end of prophase, we have visible chromosomes, a spindle is formed, and a near-broken nuclear envelope. We then move into metaphase. This is when the nuclear envelope is gone, and we have spindle fibre attachment, and the chromosomes line up at the metaphase plate, or the equator. In anaphase, we have chromosomes breaking apart at the centromere. The spindle fibres will begin to pull the sister chromatids away from each other to the opposite sides of the cell. This will split the chromosome into two V-shaped sister chromatid structures. During telophase, 
the spindle fibres pull the chromatids completely to the opposite poles of the cell. The chromatids begin to uncoil and they can no longer be called chromosomes. The nuclear envelope will reform around each set of these chromosomes. The cell now has two nuclei, each with a full set of identical DNA. Now that this has occurred, the cell will prepare to split the cytoplasm and its contents. During cytokinesis, we finally finish mitosis. We get the complete division into two daughter cells, with each daughter cell being identical to each other and their parent cell. Here, we can see the difference between interphase G1 and interphase S. Just like we learned in the previous tutorial on mitosis, we have interphase G2, then prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and finally, cytokinesis. This is a good summary of the cell cycle. And here is a diagrammatic version. Finally, let's look at what happens when mitosis is not controlled. Transition from one phase of the cell cycle to another is highly regulated by checkpoints. The cell conducts a self-assessment to ensure that the cell and the DNA are not damaged. If either of these are damaged, the cell tries to repair it. These checkpoints are regulated by proteins known as cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases, which are enzymes. These will monitor the rate of progression through the cell cycle. Special proteins, known as tumour suppressor proteins, will check for mutations. If a mutation is spotted, the tumour suppressor proteins force the cell to stop the cell cycle and attempt to repair the mutation or defect. If the cell is unable to fix the damage, the cell enters a process known as apoptosis. In other words, this is a highly programmed suicide. This is extremely important in order to prevent mutations from passing on to other cells. Cancer occurs when the above process of self-regulation goes wrong. There are two mutations in cancer that we'll be covering in this tutorial. First, we need to know that many cancers arise from mutations which result in tumour suppressor genes being unable to do their job. If a tumour suppressor gene cannot function, it cannot prevent a mutated cell from carrying out cell division and growing. Secondly, oncogenes are genes which promote cell division and growth. Mutant oncogenes force the cell to rapidly divide and proliferate. You also need to know what a tumour is. Essentially, it's a group of rapidly growing cancer cells that end up forming a rapidly growing tissue. These tumours grow extremely rapidly and are unable to control their own growth. When they acquire even more mutations, this causes them to grow more uncontrollably. Tumours can be lethal as they outcompete nutrients to fuel their growth away from normal cells. If certain organs are unable to obtain the necessary nutrients, they stop functioning and the organism eventually dies. Cancer is a leading cause of death in most countries and there are many different types of cancers. Therefore, it's very important to find treatments that are able to effectively and safely kill cancer cells. Chemotherapy is a type of therapy which uses chemical drugs to target rapidly growing cells. The field of chemotherapy has had limited advances over time and the effort to overcome cancer continues. There are hundreds of different chemotherapeutics currently available and the majority of them target different phases of a cell cycle. Some drugs can target G1, preventing the synthesis of new proteins and crucial enzymes which can kill the cancer cell. 
Methotrexate, for example, is a drug that prevents cells from forming nucleotides, which prevents cancer cells from making new DNA and dividing. Cisplatin is a drug which forms covalent bonds between the two strands of DNA. This prevents helicase from unwinding the DNA and replicating, which prevents cell division. Vincristine and vinblastine, for example, are two drugs which prevent spindle fibres from forming during mitosis, which also prevents cell division and can kill cancer cells. Chemotherapeutics are non-specific. These drugs are designed to target fast-growing cells, not specifically cancer cells. In addition to cancer cells, other fast-growing cells are cells such as hair cells, skin cells, and cells of the gut. As a consequence of chemotherapy, these cells can also unfortunately die. Chemotherapeutic drugs are also very toxic in high doses, so we have to limit the dose that we give to patients. They are also extremely mutagenic and can result in the formation of new cancers. Cancer is a very difficult disease to treat. However, we have made many significant advances in the field. Many types of cancers which were once lethal are now manageable and more and more patients are able to successfully survive cancer. With more research being done every day, the prospects of effectively treating cancer are improving steadily. We've now covered all the learning objectives for today's lesson. Feel free to skip back through the video and re-watch anything you're unsure about. We've now completed Lesson 5. If you enjoyed this tutorial, make sure to subscribe by clicking down below and leaving a comment of the topic that you'd like to see a video on. Click here to watch the rest of our videos in our A-Level Biology series, or visit our website, studymind.co.uk, for past paper compilations by topic and specification.